have effectively uh, finished uh, the first part of the course, which was the aim of which was to give you a general theory of social ontology uh, with special emphasis on institutional ontology. Uh, the theory being that uh, institutional ontology is what is distinctive about human beings. I, now, I'm not sure that I explained adequately why language is not just one institution among others, but I did uh, go over that to some extent, and in any case, it's covered pretty thoroughly in the book. Uh, but the idea is that language intuitively is the primary institution in the sense that you could imagine a tribe that had a language but didn't have much by way of institutions, and in fact, that's what the situation is with a Pidaha, as far as I can tell from Everett's work. Uh, but it's impossible that there should be uh, private property, uh, government, money, uh, et cetera, without language. And the reason we have seen uh, is that all of those institutions are linguistically created. But in that sense, language is not linguistically created. It already is language. And the key notion that distinguishes language from other institutions is the notion of meaning. It's in virtue of meaning alone that when I say snow is white, I make the statement that snow is white. I shouldn't say meaning alone, but yeah? Well, we okay, all right, let me finish. I thought maybe you're complaining about the mic or something. Um, uh, it, it's in virtue of meaning that when I say snow is white, I make the statement that snow is white. But meaning in that sense won't create precedence or private property or money. Uh, we use meaning to create those things uh, but the facts created go beyond semantics. Uh, and then I try to explain exactly how, how we impose uh, status functions. Now, another point uh, that I didn't adequately stress is not only does the creation of institutional reality contain uh, speech acts or other forms of representation that have the logical form of status function declarations, but the continued existence of private property, uh, government, universities, money, professors, students, etc., also has recognitions and acceptances that function as status function declaration. You are reinforcing the institution whenever you use it. Uh, I remark somewhat mysteriously that uh, Money and private property don't wear out with continued use uh, the way shirts and shoes do. You use your shoes over and over, they get worn out. You use private property over and over, it doesn't get worn out, it gets reinforced. And the thesis there, though it's more subtle and more difficult to maintain, or more difficult to establish, is that our continued representation of something as money, or as a professor, or as a government, the continued recognition or acceptance of the legitimacy of the status function serves to reinforce the status function. And this is why uh, in institutional stru structures it's so important to the people responsible for the survival of the institution that it should not be readily flouted. One of the things that struck me uh, was how readily the system of authority and the university was undermined uh, when people simply ignored it, if they just didn't pay any attention to it. And when we watch the movie of uh, Berkeley in the 60s, you'll see that uh, Clark Kerr uh, was probably as intelligent as anybody else uh, uh, dealing with this situation, really had a misconception when he staged this, uh, this great ceremony in the Greek theater. It was comical uh, in its upshot because by that time, he, the system of authority had already been effectively undermined, so it didn't work. Uh, but in any case, the, the claim I'm making now, and some of the, uh, the reviewers uh, don't understand this, uh, the reviewers of the book that you've been asked to read don't understand that the status functions don't work just, the status function declarations don't work just in the creation of the institution, but in its continued existence, in its continued uh, survival and reinforcement. Now, again, I have to emphasize, it needn't be an explicit speech act. We don't all have to get together and say, we appoint you uh, department chairman 
I, it's just a, a single statement. You get a letter from the dean saying, uh, you're the chairman. And the guys on the softball team don't have to get together and announce out loud, uh, you're the captain of the team. Uh, they just have to recognize you as the captain of the team, continue to acknowledge your authority, and otherwise reinforce uh, the, the deontology that goes with being captain of the team. Okay, so those are, are two things that I want you to fully to understand, that language is special. Language is not just one institution among others. Now, I advance an empirical hypothesis. It's not a philosophical a priori truth, but it's an empirical hypothesis. Once you have a tribe with language, you're bound to have other institutions. Uh, somebody's going to be able to say things like, this is my property, that's my woman, he's the boss. And once you get that, you're off and running with status functions. Okay, so that's one, those are some loose ends I wanted to clear up. Now, uh, the main topic of today's lecture is going to be beginning of the next great subject, uh, rationality. I began it last time, but we didn't get very far. But again, before we do that, I need to say a little bit more about Darwinian forms of explanation uh, because uh, they are important. <coughs> Why? The interesting thing about the development of human uh, intellectual life is not only do we invent new explanations, but we invent new forms of explanation. And Darwin uh, is acknowledged for having, or Darwin and Wallace, uh, for having uh, discovered a new explanation of uh, the evolution of species. But what I want to emphasize, it's a different type of explanation. It has a different logical structure from explanations that we're used to. And I didn't make that fully clear, so I want to go over that. Okay, so now we're going to stop for questions. Jennifer. Okay, well, by the way, I, I, I forgot to announce, uh, do you, we're going to get the papers at the end of the hour. Oh, you're going to get the papers today? Okay, the new paper topics on Thursday, and the paper tax will, the papers that you uh, I handed in will be given back today at the end of class. Oh, okay, that's already uh, announced on the blackboard. All right, any other questions then about what I've just said? Because if not, I want to go on and say a little bit about more about uh, Darwinian modes of explanation. Okay, let's go on. The the form of explanation that comes most naturally to us uh, is intentionalistic. And the reason is uh, that the a child develops with uh, intentionality as its most primitive experience of causation. So when you're explaining why something happened, I, a typical way is to explain, well, who did it and what, for what purpose did they do it? And the uh, pre-theoretical uh, communities were told use, ex use teleological or intentionalistic explanations of natural phenomena. So if, it's, if the weather's terribly bad, it's because the gods are angry at us, uh, for example. That's a typical intentionalistic mode of explanation. Now, it was an enormous development when people got the idea that there are forms of explanation that made no reference to intentionality at all. You just describe uh, causes operating in the world independently of anybody's intentionality. There are no, uh, there need be no supernatural or no uh, uh, built-in uh, structural causes of an in intentionalistic kind in the universe. It's just causation occurs. And then came the great 17th century revolution where people got the idea of scientific laws. And I, I don't know how far back that went, uh, but it may well be that the Greeks had the idea of a scientific law. But it, it's, it seems clear to me that in the intellectual history of Western civilization, uh, it was in the 17th century that people began to think everything ought to be subsumable under a law, that laws ought to describe everything that happens. Now, the metaphor of law is not harmless. Uh, so to this day, people will still say things like, everything is governed by laws. Watch, I'll show you something governed by a law. Well, that's total nonsense, of course. Nothing is governed. It's just a force operating. And it's because of Hume that people got the idea that really any causal explanation has to be backed by a law. You must have a law. Otherwise, you don't have a causal explanation. Why? Well, there isn't anything to causation except regularity. Hume established that. 
Now, I think all of that is mistaken, and I'll come back to that later when we talk about explanation in the social sciences and explanations of human behavior. But in any case, that was an enormous advance to have non-intentionalistic forms of explanation. Now, what happened with Darwin? And again, when I say Darwin, that's short for Darwin and Wallace. And, may, and maybe it's a cheat that Darwin got credit because Wallace discovered the same stuff independently. But in any case, we're not interested in giving credit now as we are in describing an intellectual development. Here is what happened <clears throat> from our point of view, from a philosophical point of view. The greatest single argument for uh, the existence of God, uh, the argument that appealed to more people than the uh, traditional teleological and other sorts of arguments was the argument from design. As Leibniz said, if you find a watch in the field, you have to suppose uh, there was a watchmaker. And it looked like there were watches everywhere. Uh, think of the human eyeball or just think of human beings. It looks like they were designed by some intelligent being, that some form of teleology or purpose functioned in their design. And one of the interesting things that happened in Protestant countries after Darwin, particularly in England, there was a massive decline in the intellectual level of people uh, going into uh, the ministry, of people becoming uh, preachers in the Anglican church. It's hard for us to appreciate uh, the intellectual influence of preachers in the 19th century. So a standard literary form of, edu of, of the intellectual leaders of the country would be their published sermons. Uh, so uh, um, uh, uh, Re the Reverend Jones, uh, the, the sermon of uh, the, uh, the preacher in uh, Sacramento uh, would publish a lifetime of his sermons, and these would be very important uh, documents widely received. I, I, I will not ask you, how, when did you last read somebody's collected sermons? At any rate, as a literary form, this has fallen into obsolescence. But one of the reasons is that the intellectual level of people going into the ministry declined drastically after Darwin because it became impossible to think that you could justify things by design. All right, what did Darwin show? Darwin showed that the appearance of purpose, the explanation of something existing because of a purpose, that that could be replaced by two levels of explanation. And I'm going to go through a couple of examples so this will be absolutely clear to you. If you ask the question, why do fish have the shape they do? The temptation is to say, well, because it's easier to move around in water if you're shaped like a fish than if you're shaped like a brick. And if you're asked a question I asked earlier, why do leaves turn toward the sun? The temptation is to say, well, it's because by turning toward the sun, the leaf can get more energy and thus perform photosynthesis better and thus uh, enhance the chances of survival of the plant. In both cases, you cited a purpose. Uh, in both cases, in, in the case of the leaf, uh, we almost we seem to be attributing intentionality to the plant. But, but even if we subtracted that mistake, we would still say, all the same, the plant is designed in such a way that it turns its leaf toward the sun because it aids in its survival. Now, what Darwin did was substitute two levels of explanation for the original, I'll use the traditional jargon, for the original teleological level, he substituted to let teleology here, as you know, means purpose, and it's a form of intentionality. For the intentionalistic explanation, which had to do with purpose, either the purpose of the organism or the purpose of the designer, <coughs> Darwin substituted two levels of explanation. The reason the plant turns its leaves toward the sun is because the plant secretes a growth hormone called auxin, and secretions of auxin are a function of the sun. They're a function of uh, light uh, to which the plant is exposed. And the variable secretions of auxin 
will turn the leaves toward the source of the light, toward the sun in this case, and, and now that this is the second level of explanation, plants that do that are more likely to survive than plants that don't. So notice the original teleological level of explanation cited survival as part of the explanation. Now the replacement explanation with its two levels of the causal level and the functional level also cites survival, but survival now functions not as a purpose, but it's just something that happens. However, without that happening, the plant species will not continue. It won't survive. It will become extinct. So here was our original explanation. Plants turn their leaves toward the sun in order to survive. And that's got a double kind of teleology, either because the plant needs or wants to survive, or because the designer designed the plant in such a way that would do that in order to survive. But there is a level of intentionality or teleology in plants turn their leaves toward the sun in order to survive. Now that is replaced by a double level of explanation. Plants don't turn their leaves toward the sun for any purpose that the plant has or any purpose anybody else has. Rather, the cause of the plants turning the leaf toward the sun is variable secretions of a growth hormone. And, and now we introduce time. Now we introduce long periods of evolutionary time. Plants that do that are more likely to survive than plants that don't. So now you still have survival in the explanation, but it's not a goal, it's not an objective, it's just something that happens. And that's called a functional level of explanation. So the causal level is auxin, and the functional level is survival. It augments the plant's probabilities of survival. But to repeat, survival is not a goal, it's just something that happens. Without its happening, the plant species will not survive. That's uh, the way that the original teleological level is replaced by these two levels. Now in the textbooks, or at least the ones I've seen, uh, they call this one functional. But in fact, of course, it's causal as well. They're both causal. It's just that the functional level is a causation that operates over periods of time, over many different generations. And the function of the cause in this case is to facilitate the survival of the species. All right, now with that in mind, the question naturally arises, can we do this maneuver on human beings on their apparently social forms of intentionality? Can we cite, uh, that, uh, can we cite explanations of human behavior or social, uh, can we cite social phenomena which appear to have a teleology but where we substitute for the teleology a causal level and a functional level. Now this was a source of embarrassment uh, to uh, the sociobiologists, but their favorite example was the incest taboo. Why? Well, the incest taboo, according to the anthropologists, is universal. All cultures have an incest taboo. And now why do they forbid uh, incest? Well, uh, the, uh, I think, uh, normal, uh, uh, pre-theoretical people would say, well, they forbid incest because it's evil. Uh, it's a bad thing to do, so that's why all societies forbid it. But now for that teleological level, they have the incest to boot to serve, uh, in order to serve a moral end, we're going to substitute both a causal and a functional level. The number that we did on leaves with oxen and survival we're going to do with incest. And the analogy to oxen is supposed to be the uh, lack of desire that uh, people have for people that they were brought up, with whom they were brought up in close proximity. So apparently, according to this view, brothers and sisters lack sexual desire for each other. And parents and children lack sexual desire for each other, at least the children lack sexual desire for the parents because they were brought up with them. And as I told you, uh, the favorite evidence for this, the favorite uh, at least anecdotal exemplar of this uh, inhibition that people feel is supposed to be the experience on the kibbutzim in Israel, and I'm including the moshav as well as the kibbutz. And the idea is that kids brought up 
in close proximity in the nurseries where the parents lose, uh, where the traditional notion of the family is, uh, is abandoned and the children are brought up in common, I, the idea is, and the evidence tends to show this, uh, that they don't marry among other people in the kibbutz. They go over the hill and find somebody from the uh, kibbutz on the other side. So from our kibbutz, they go to uh, the kibbutz meets Eshkaliot, or something on the other side of the mountain, uh, <clears throat> where they don't know the boys and girls. And they seem, they, the girls always look better on the other side of the, uh, uh, of the mountain. And if you grew up in an American suburb, you're familiar with this phenomenon. Uh, I, well, I won't tell you about my horrible experiences, but in any case, I, I think this is a common experience. There's a certain uh, exoticism about uh, people who, with whom you did not grow up. Okay, so that's supposed to be the analogy with oxen. Uh, is sexual inhibition among people with whom you've grown up in close uh, proximity. And of course, the survival value of the incest taboo is supposed to be that by prohibiting incest, you mix the genes and you get better uh, offspring, you get better zygotes uh, if you do not have the same genetic uh, core repeated uh, throughout. Uh, that if you, the, the cost of, uh, of incest is effectively uh, the giving up the advantage of biparental reproduction. Biparental reproduction is a tremendously inefficient method of reproducing, but it does mix up the genes so you don't get the, the repetition of recessive genes. And cases where you do get a lot of intermarriage, uh, as in the, the pharaohs, uh, or the, uh, the Romanovs, the Russian uh, royal family, you do tend to get uh, diseases with rece from recessive genes such as hemophilia among, among the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the czar's family. And the universality of the incest taboo has an exception in such cases uh, because among the pharaohs, uh, effectively, it was noblesse oblige. You had to marry your sister because nobody else was good enough for you if you're the, uh, the son of a pharaoh. You had to marry in the family because you couldn't just marry riffraff. You couldn't marry uh, normal aristocrats. You, you had to marry somebody who was, uh, had your own st uh, sort of stature and that meant your sister. But those are odd cases and you do pay a price for that. Uh, okay, <clears throat> now there are en enormous traditional problems for the sociobiological level of explanation. Uh, if sociobiology is going to explain our moral prohibitions, uh, then how do you do deal with uh, the persistence of moral traits that appear, or at least uh, behavioral patterns, let's say, some of them are moral and some moral issues and others are not, behavioral patterns that appear to have no survival value. And the two famous problems for the sociobiologists uh, are <coughs> altruism and homosexuality. Uh, altruism clearly has a genetic basis, but on this model of explanation, since by definition the altruist here is someone who decreases the chance of his genes surviving by his willingness to sacrifice himself or herself, uh, then how is it that altruism can survive and the other a puzzling case is homosexuality. Uh, and they're uh, assuming that homosexuality has any genetic base at all, as it seems to have at least some genetic base. Then how does homosexuality survive? Now one of the fun, I'll, I'll take a question in a second. Now one of the fun ar arguments over the past few decades in, in these discussions has been to see the ingenuity with which uh, the sociobiologists try to explain homosexuality and altruism. And they have various intellectual maneuvers. Uh, one of the favorites was kin selection. Uh, really, the idea is uh, that when you're, <coughs> when you're behaving altruistically, uh, the altruism, you tend to favor members of your own family. So you give up your life, but the genes go on because it's your family whose uh, genes you are protecting. Similarly, with homosexuality, the argument went at one point, homosexuals are more inclined to help out around the house in raising the children. What the evidence for this I was, I'm not sure. And I often wondered in the singles bars, uh, in the gay bars of San Francisco, how many of these guys are really helping out raising their brothers and sisters? But in any case, uh, these are uh, uh, some of the difficulties with e explaining the, uh, the phenomena in this zone. And similarly, with the case of 
of uh, altruism, uh, the idea was that it's true that the individual who's willing to sacrifice himself or, or herself decreases the chance of their own genetic survival, but they may be helping the family. And then another variant of this was group selection. And I, I, I want to mention these problems to you, not because I think there's a simple answer to them, because we'll come back later when we talk about general patterns of explanation of social behavior. But two difficulties, uh, two uh, difficulties recognized by the sociobiologists were the problem of how homosexuality survives, since by definition, uh, homosexuals don't reproduce uh, biologically with other homosexuals. Uh, and how does altruism survive? Because altruism, by definition, that is, we have a, a, a special definition of altruism here, is behavior which uh, intentionally decreases the chance of your own genetic survival, usually done for the benefit of other people. One uh, guy I debated on this said, well, um, it's true that the military hero is, uh, is more likely to lose his own uh, genetic uh, uh, po possibilities of reproduction. But in the meantime, he certainly uh, appeals uh, to females. Uh, so he cashes in on his heroism in the short run, even though he may not be able to raise his offspring in the long run. Uh, part of the fun of this field is, is, is the scope. In the absence of serious experimental techniques, the scope for uh, anecdotal arguments uh, that, that uh, it, it allows us. OK, now let's stop and take questions. Did you, somebody at the back had a question. You had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Here is the puzzle to state it precisely. Assume uh, that there is some genetic basis for homosexuality, a reasonable assumption. Assume that the chances of homosexuals reproducing with other homosexuals yeah, is less than the chances of reproduction at large, and then you have a problem. Th those are the two assumptions. Nobody says no homosexual ever succeeded in producing children. That's not the that would be absurd. Uh, but th but this is the problem. I I'm not telling you what I think the solution is. I'm just telling you there is a problem for the for this model of explanation. Yes. Yeah. Well, OK, now another assumption we're making is that some genetic basis uh, for homosexuality. Uh, I think one of the assumptions behind popular culture, uh, which is mistaken, is that somehow or other everybody's uh, sexual preferences are fixed. And of course, they're very much in flux. And God knows what the internet is doing. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm astounded whenever I look at the internet. There are forms. Uh, now, here's an interesting uh, philosophical problem. Why is it that in this field we have the concept of perversion? You see, uh, the concept of sexual perversion ought to puzzle us. I'm, I don't think we have the concept of walking perversion. I mean, I walk in a way that a lot of people disapprove, but nobody ever says to me, you pervert. I watch the way you walk, you see. We don't care about walking. Or, or some people eat differently from others, but nobody say, well, that's a perverted way to eat, unless you really have a very strange attitude. But where sex is concerned, we think, yeah, that's perversions. Um, uh, but now this has changed uh, in the past 100 years. Homosexuality used to be everybody's favorite uh, example of a perversion. Now it's just regarded, as they say, I love this expression, due to Max Weber. It's an alternative lifestyle. Uh, OK, so it went from being a perversion to being an alternative lifestyle. And wonder, one wonders how far it can go. Anyway, say some more. Yes. So wouldn't the mechanism in the case of the incest taboo really be the taboo telling your children is wrong? Have yeah, the question is how does that uh, w the what we're trying to explain is the taboo. We're trying to explain why it is that all cultures forbid uh, uh, the, now, if uh, anthropologists were here, this is an anthropology building, uh, they would point out, well, uh, different cultures have different incest taboos. It's not all the same. Uh, some uh, cultures you can marry your cousin, others you can't. But all cultures have the, 
the nuclear family prohibition. Prohibition against mothers and sons, fathers and daughters, brothers and sisters. All cultures have that much. Beyond that, there are lots of variety. Yes? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I, I like that. The problem is, what is the mechanism for the transmission of the taboo? And the idea is, it's transmitted socially. It's not, it's not like oxen, uh, where uh, the uh, uh, DNA just grinds out the oxen. I don't know, I mean, I don't know how you get from the genotype to the phenotype, nobody does, but we're pretty confident that it works. But now it seems funny to think I have a gene that uh, tells me uh, to go around uh, prohibiting uh, incest. That, that doesn't seem like it's plausible. What we're trying to explain is a prohibition. And I argued that the most this could explain, uh, the, uh, uh, the kibbutz syndrome would be an inhibition. People are less likely. Uh, uh, to be attracted to these people. But if that's a, a case, if there's a genuine inhibition, you wouldn't need a prohibition. You only need prohibitions where you don't already have an inhibition. We don't need a general moral principle against eating mud. It would be very bad for us if we ate an awful lot of mud, but people are not attracted to eating mud. Uh, but people are attracted to members of the opposite sex uh, to whom they're related. And in fact, I think one of these things, one of the problems that these guys can't explain is, in fact, incest is pretty common in certain parts of the world. Okay, we'll come back to this. Yes? Uh, I, mean, I, I guess I'm just to follow up on that. I'm still not sure I understand what the conclusion is. Yeah. Because with the incest taboo and the existence of altruism, I don't see a need for a biological explanation of yeah. those things just because the uh, survival of a society at large uh, is served by that. And that the only way you could make it work is to say, just as the genes produce oxen, so the genes produce t the incest taboo. And that's a tougher case to make out. That's a harder case to make out. But, I mean, the, we have an explanation for the existence of an incest taboo. Yeah, the explanation, the, the functional explanation is you, you mix up uh, the genes better if you, if you have biparental reproduction, and you lose the advantage of that if you have incest. That's the functional explanation. That's the analogy uh, to uh, the uh, survival in the uh, case of the, uh, of the leaves turning toward the sun. The question is, what's the analogy to the secretion of oxen? And you're saying, well, people just feel this uh, 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 prohibition. They feel a sense of prohibition. That's not what these guys think. They think they have to explain that sense by something more basic. And the more basic thing they think is the fact that you're supposed to be less attracted to people with whom you grew up. I want to come back to you, but let's take her and then you. Yes? Just also to remember who the target is, right? Yeah. The target is the sociobiologist. So this is not a general problem no, that no. you're struggling with. It's a problem yeah. for a certain approach. No, that's right. So yeah. And let me situate that in an even and more. Yeah, we're talking about a specific movement to try to explain all human behavior using Darwinian methods. And I think it is very limited, though I think there's a lot to be said for it. I'll give you some examples uh, of it later. Um, you see, their target was Freud. Freud says the explanation of the incest taboo is it's just too destructive of the family uh, if you allow sexual relations within the family. I, it just uh, the normal family relationships will be uh, totally broken apart if you allow sexual relationship within members of the immediate family. That's I mean I'm simplifying here, but that's essentially the Freudian explanation, and they think that's analogous to these uh, purposive explanations. Uh, that that's a kind of teleological explanation, and what they want is what they think is a more scientific, uh, more basic explanation. And the important thing is that there shouldn't be any intentionality. In the, in the explanatory apparatus, in the explanands, there should be no intentionality. That's the whole point of this, that the appearance of purpose is eliminated entirely by the Darwinian explanation. It looks like the universe is full of purposes, but Darwin showed that there, there is no purpose in the uh, in, uh, origin of species, that the, uh, the phenotypes all have these forms of explanation that eliminate teleology. And the idea is we're going to eliminate 
teleology in the explanation, what's going to be explained is the intentionality. We're going to explain the intentionality in the same way here we explain the behavior of the, of the plant. Say some more. Yeah. Purpose. Uh, avoiding uh, the intentionality of people yeah. seems far less. Well, I'm with you on that. Yeah. But I'm now talking about a specific intellectual yeah. movement. Now, they did have, uh, I mean, here's another explanation they offered. It is a stereotype in our culture, and apparently it's common in other sorts of cultures. Uh, that men are, have a more aggressive uh, sexual um, a, a range of desires than women do. Roughly speaking, uh, uh, guys seek uh, more girls than girls seek guys. Girls tend, I mean, this is the stereotype in our co culture, is that the female has tend to be looking for a single male or at least a rather small group of males, whereas uh, guys are supposed to be looking uh, over the whole damned field. I mean, this is at least the stereotype. Now, the explanation for that stereotype is supposed to be as follows. <coughs> Women have a rather limited number of eggs that they produce in their life, so it's in their genetic interest uh, to uh, find a mate who will help them to produce and raise I, I, the limited number of infants that's going to be possible for them to do in their life. Guys, on the other hand, have a rather large supply of, uh, of semen, uh, enough uh, at least to repopulate the United States, if not to re the world keeps growing on us, but at least to repopulate the United States. So it's in their genetic interest to seek to spread their genes around as much as they can. Now, neither party is supposed to be thinking this. That is, this not supposed to be, the guy is not supposed to be thinking, I sure want to have more offspring, so let's go in the singles bar and see what we can find. That's not what he's thinking. This is the explanation of why he thinks what he does is that it will increase his chances of genetic survival of his genes if he impregnates as many females as possible, whereas it increases the female's chance of genetic survival if she restricts the range of people who can impregnate her to those who are more likely uh, to give her better offspring and, off, uh, and offspring that th where they will help out in raising uh, the offspring uh, to the point where the offspring can survive on its own. Uh, that's another favorite pattern of explanation in sociobiology. Now, it's possible to make it sound kind of idiotic, but there may be something in it. I mean, there is this stereotype. The problem with it is, uh, one problem with it is, it looks like you can use that pattern of explanation to explain anything. I suppose we had the reverse stereotype. Suppose we all thought, well, you know, girls, you got to watch out for them because they're always, they're always on the make, you see. And guys, well, guys tend to be more shy and restricted. Uh, then we could use the same pattern of explanation. Well, that's because guys got a whole lot of genes, a whole lot of potential uh, offspring, and so they need to pick out a possible mate who will uh, get, increase the chances of survival, whereas the, uh, the females, they have a very limited number of potential offspring. That's why they got to get as many guys as possible to make sure they reproduce as much as they can. That is, it looks like this pattern of explanation will fit anything. On the other hand, I do have to say, I think there's something appealing about it. It's thus, we, we, we need an explanation for the obvious fact uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, sexual uh, proclivities of the males and the females tend to be different. And there ought to be an explanation for that. So I'm dissatisfied with this explanation because it looks like I could uh, fiddle it around so that it fit any pattern of behavior. But at the same time, it does seem to me there may well be something in it. Uh, okay, anybody, um, we'll come back when we talk about general patterns of explaining human behavior. I'm going to come back to some of these points, but I want you to see one of the candidates out there is to try to eliminate intentionality in the explanation of uh, social behavior uh, and try to find general patterns of intentionality that themselves have a Darwinian explanation. So the idea is there's no Teleolo teleological or intentionalistic explanation of the incest taboo, 
Uh, there's no teleological or intentionalistic explanation of uh, moral prohibitions in general. They are to be explained by uh, more basic biological phenomena, uh, just like the shape of the fish. I didn't go through the example of the fish, but you can see how it's uh, supposed to be just like the example of the leaf. Uh, just like the apparent intentionalistic behavior of plants or of fish can be, uh, or the shape of the fish can be explained by uh, uh, two levels of explanation. A causal level that cites the mechanism by which the phenotype is produced, and a functional level that says not you have that phenotype in order to survive, that's teleological, but rather you, organisms that have that phenotype are just more likely to survive than those that don't. Survival still functions in the explanation, but it's not a goal. It's not an objective. It's just something that happens. It's just something that happens, and because it happens, uh, the, the uh, species uh, 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 survives in a way that wouldn't otherwise survive. Yes, Vanessa. What might therefore recommend that they call it something other than functional? What well, that's right. I, I think functional is the wrong word, and I want to say it's higher level causal, uh, and it's I, uh, it's a causal explanation that operates diachronically. It operates over time. And of course, that's what Darwin did, was introduce uh, the, uh, the idea of long periods of evolutionary time. It does seem amazing to think uh, that the human eyeball could have evolved uh, out of uh, random recombinations of one-celled organisms. Uh, on the other hand, give us five billion years or even three billion years, and then it seems more likely. And now we understand, uh, or at least we think we understand, how uh, the uh, human and animal eyeball could have evolved. This was an early objection to Darwin. There's no way that natural selection could explain the eyeball. OK, maybe it can explain the ear or the thumbnail, but the eyeball? Well, we have an explanation of how the eyeball evolved. OK, uh, this is kind of fun, but I want to move on to rationality. But you get a question. You had your hand halfway up, so you get half a question. Any ways to what? To kind of like uh, to jump over this hurdle in terms of uh, methodology of like explaining things genetically or that are anthropological? Well, that's what they're trying to do. Let me explain the intellectual situation we're in. The great horror of intellectual life of the hard nosed variety of which we're all inheritors, the great horror is Cartesianism and the idea that, that the world might divide into two. Uh, the physical and the spiritual. Uh, the only country in which Cartesianism is still vaguely respectable is France. Uh, when you say Cartesianism in any other country, people think, you know, that's like saying communist in the 1950s. But in France, a lot of people don't mind being called Cartesian. Well, that they were brought up in a high school. And uh, the uh, French high schools uh, teach philosophy and God knows what they teach. It's horrible. I saw the, uh, the, uh, bac the, bac the baccalaureate exams uh, for this uh, year had a section on consciousness. Fine, great consciousness. Guess who they wanted them to read? Heidegger and Husserl. Well, thanks a lot. But anyway, so you have a problem. The great horror in our intellectual life is any kind of spiritualism, any kind of mentalism. So there is a kind of mindless materialism, and no pun intended, a kind of mindless materialism, which is, so to speak, our religion. And that's what these guys are operating on. Now, I think the whole uh, way, this whole set of categorization, materialism uh, against dualism, that all of that is misconceived. But the idea that drives these people is that any explanation of basic phenomenon cannot end in intentionality. There cannot be any Cartesian souls at the bottom of the explanation. It must be some materialistic form of explanation, and that's what the sociobiologists think they're doing. Uh, I once reviewed one of these books in which I said, well, you're not going to talk about human biology if you don't talk about intentionality. Uh, so in Wilson's next book, there is a reference in the middle of the book saying, sociobiologists have to take intentionality seriously. No footnotes, nothing. No beginning, no end, no follow-up, nothing. So anyway, that, uh, uh, they do recognize that there are biological phenomena of a mental kind. But, it, but the purpose, the overriding intellectual 
uh, motive is to give a mechanical or materialistic or non-intentionalistic explanation of social phenomena. Now later on I'm going to so, uh, show that the, the objective is misconceived because intentionality is a biological phenomenon, but they don't see that. They think it's still a kind of Cartesianism. Okay, any other questions? Let's go on to rationality. All right. Um, <coughs> There is a certain conception of rationality uh, which is very widespread in our intellectual culture. It comes out, uh, if you've ever had a course in economics or if you've ever read a book or an article on decision theory, it comes out more or less explicitly. When I took economics as an undergraduate a long time ago, <coughs> it, was, it wasn't so much uh, preached as it was taken for granted. Uh, occasionally they might mention puzzles about it, but it was assumed that economic agents were rational. And indeed, on this conception, economics as a discipline presupposed the rationality of the economic agent. And what is rationality so conceived? Well, I made a list of some of the features uh, and I naturally, uh, I guess being a philosopher, my uh, temptation was to list the features I disagreed with. But here are the ones that seem to me absolutely common. And by the way, this is widespread in philosophy. I think most philosophers have this conception of rationality as well. Uh, the first is actions are caused by beliefs and desires. Our old friends Bell and Des, and you might add, actions where rational are caused by beliefs and desires. And then it turns out that rationality, if you assume that, then rationality can be rather easily designed. The rational act is the act which maximizes the probability of satisfying your desires given your beliefs. So you have a set of beliefs about uh, uh, what uh, kind of car would be best for you, and you want a certain kind of car, and you have a certain set of uh, resources of how much money you can spend, and then you try to maximize the probability that your desires will be satisfied on, given the assumption of your beliefs. Now, if you say that just like that, it sounds pretty good to me. I mean, I, that's a lot of the time what we do. And what advertisers try to do is influence your desires and uh, beliefs. Uh, they try to make such and such a model of car seem more sexy uh, by showing uh, the, the, the car is always populated by beautiful women or whatever in the ads. And then they have stories about how uh, uh, the car is cheaper, you pay less for it, et cetera. OK, the actions where rational are caused by beliefs and desires. Now, a second principle on this conception of rationality is that if you're going to be rational, you have to follow the rules of rationality. And the rules will tell you, the rules of Bayesian decision theory will tell you how to calculate your chances of satisfying your desires given your beliefs. There are a set of rules that will enable you uh, to reason rationally and make decisions rationally. Now, a third a conception, a third piece of this conception is that, in fact, rationality is a separate cognitive capacity. Uh, indeed, we have no less, no less an authority than Aristotle. We have no less an authority than Aristotle to say it is the distinctive cognitive capacity of our species. We're defined as rational animals. We're defined as animals capable of reasoning, and no other animal can reason in the way that we do. There is a problem, however, with this, and that is weakness of will is a problem. And indeed, you remember, famously, 
the Greeks said that people always do what they believe to be best. Hence, when somebody does something that's not best, it can really only be due to ignorance. It must have been due to some kind of mistake or lack of knowledge or lack of ignorance. And the argument goes, look, if you're doing something voluntarily, intentionally, you're not forced to do it, nobody's putting a gun at your head, you're doing as we say of your own free will, then it must be because you think that's the best thing to do. But then if that's right, then it would be impossible uh, for anybody to do something that ran counter to what they thought was the best thing to do. So in cases of apparent weakness of will, and the Greek word has uh, become common here in the literature, in the cases of apparent akrasia, it can only be because there was something wrong with the beliefs and the desires. As Davidson says in his article on weakness of will, he says, well, this is the case where you didn't have an unconditional desire where you acted out of weakness of will. If you had an honest to John, all out, unconditional desire, then you would act on that desire. Now, I have to gasp in disbelief when I read this because I have acrasia several times a day. Uh, and it's not a big deal. I think, you know, I really ought to think about what I'm going to say in my Philosophy 138 lecture. Yeah, but somehow there, there are all kinds of other things in the office that seem kind of interesting to me. And then there's this stupid computer over there and all kinds of surfing that could be done on that. And if somebody said, yes, but what do you think is the best thing to do right now? The answer is obvious. The best thing to do would be to prepare my lecture. So what are you doing? Well, I'm goofing around in front of the television set. Maybe this never happens to you, uh, this sort of event. But I have to say, it does happen to me quite frequently. I go to the party and I say, absolutely no more than one glass of wine at the party. Well, the wine tasted pretty good. And they came around with more glasses. And if somebody had said to me, now, what's the best thing for you to do right now? I would say, the best thing to do would be not to have any more wine. Uh, could I have another glass of the Chardonnay? Thank you. And that happens all the time. And as I remarked the other day, the picture of weakness of will, if somehow or other the guy is in a frenzy of lust, that's not the way it is with me. I, I don't think, I've got to have a Chardonnay, and I lunge over and grab the uh, glass off of the tray. No, it's quite elegant. I, I never miss a beat in the elegant conversation I'm having with Lady Frisbee or Sir John. Uh, and, and I simply pick up another glass and begin to sip it as if nothing were happening. Now, I think this is, uh, uh, if you find this story incredible, uh, you're very much in comfort with the, with the philosophical tradition. But I think these things happen. Uh, very common. So there's something wrong with this conception of rationality if it says weakness of will. Literally, weakness of will is impossible on the tradition. They say that it apparently occurs, but apparent cases of weakness of will are really something else. I'll just, I'll take questions a second. I want to go uh, through these because I'm going to, I'm going to refute all of these. Now, um, the whole system works on the assumption that you have a set of primary desires. And you bring these primary desires to the decision-making situation. Rationality will consist in how to satisfy your primary desires. And this often, typically, will cons consist in selecting means to achieve your ends. That's why this type of reasoning is typically called means ends reasoning. You have these ends, and you try to satisfy them by forming secondary desires. You had the primary desires, but rationality will enable you to perform secondary desires. So you go into the travel agent. Nobody does this anymore. It's all done on the net. But in the old days, you go in the travel agent, and you say, I want a plane ticket to Paris. Now, notice they don't look at you and say, what are you, some kind of a ticket fetishist? Uh, what's this big deal about a ticket? Are you, are you, you lusting after tickets? No, uh, they understand. It's a means to an end. You have reached Paris. The best way to go to Paris is to go by plane. If I'm going to go to plane, I have to buy, buy plane, I have to buy a ticket. So I form a secondary desire for the ticket. Somebody says, what are you going to do this afternoon? I say, well, I want to go to my dentist uh, because I, um, I'm due now to have a tooth filled. 
And the guy says, what, you want to have somebody drilling your teeth? Well, that's not, as they say, an end in itself. That is a means to fulfilling other ends, whereas the primary desires are the ends in themselves, uh, where I, I, you drink the beer not because it is a means to some other end. I need to get fat, or I need to improve the stock of uh, 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 of the Budweiser Brewing Company. No, it's an end in itself. I'm not doing that. But when I go to the dentist, that is a means. The secondary desires give you means toward achieving the various ends that you have given by the primary desires. Furthermore, another basic assumption uh, is the whole set of beliefs and desires must be consistent. Uh, because if you had inconsistent primary desires, then it would be impossible to reason. And you all know that an inconsistent proposition entails any proposition whatever, so you'd get a total breakdown. Now, we could add to this list, but it gives you a certain conception of rationality, and I want to say I think it's wrong in every detail, and I'm going to try to offer you another conception of rationality. But first, let's take questions. I had so I saw some hands up. Uh, it was somebody who had their hand up and I said, was, did you have your hand yeah. up? Yeah. yeah. I'm still over there. Hmm. We'll come back to you. Okay, that's the target. Now I want to go through some of these. I've already said a few words about this, but, but it, there's an interesting puzzle. When I do something in the full knowledge that I don't think it's the best thing for me to do, uh, how is that possible? How is it possible that I can do something fully cognizant of the fact that that's not the best thing for me to be doing right then and there? Did you have your hand up? No, okay. But you finally got yours up, yeah. halfway. I mean, isn't that uh, pretty straightforwardly a case of irrationality? When I do something on the basis of uh, it not being the best thing uh, to do, yes, that's irrational behavior. The problem is, how is it possible, given that actions are caused by beliefs and desires? And I did have uh, the belief and the desire. I had the desire to do the best thing and the belief that this was not the best thing. And yet, I did the thing I thought was not the best thing and did it voluntarily. See, there are cases where the guy is in a grip of an addiction or a lust or a rage. And if he could pause and think, he might think, OK, this, I shouldn't really be doing this. But the, the problem is not that these cases are rational. Of course, they're irrational. The question is, how are they possible at all, given that all actions are caused by beliefs and desires, and that I had the beliefs and the desires? The standard account is to say, well, there was something wrong with your beliefs and desires. That's Davidson's account. Davidson's account is that, and it's Hare's account also, uh, that, that when you acted out of weakness of will, it's because you didn't really have an unconditional desire to do the thing you thought best. You only had a conditional, a sort of second-rate desire to do the thing that you thought best. I'm very confused what best is here. Yeah, best means high, uh, that which you value the most. It, it needn't be, it ca could be moral. Now, Hare makes this a criterion for your moral judgment. The moral principle says, uh, uh, this is R.M. Hare I'm talking about, the moral principle is the one that you will act on given uh, all the other considerations you have. If you acted this way uh, as opposed to that way, then that proves that this was an expression of your moral principle. So the mo moral principle is supposed to be the one that you act on. And irrationality, if actions are caused by beliefs and desires, then if you act irrationally, as uh, weakness of will illustrates, it must be because there's something wrong with the beliefs and the desires. Now, my problem is very simple. And that is, I have a beliefs and desires all the time. And there's nothing wrong with my beliefs and desires. It's just I don't always act on, the, on what I think is the most desirable thing to do. I often do things that are not the most desirable thing to do, like have another glass of wine at the party. We'll come back to this. Yes. Yeah. Say 
Ja. Ja. Right. Of course. Okay, no, no, I, th this is not the problem. I didn't state the problem clearly, so let me say it again. Granted that you want, uh, granted that you believe that the best thing to do is not to drink the wine, and you want to do the best thing, granted uh, uh, that you do want the wine, uh, you're certainly acting on your desire when you take the wine, but why do you act on that desire when that's not your highest desire? Your highest desire, as you are perfectly willing to admit. I mean, I, I, your spouse points at you, should you really be drinking that wine? Don't you really think it's best not to drink the wine? And, and if you're me, you say quite elegantly, yes, I'm sure you're right. And then you take a glass of wine. This, that's the puzzle. How is it possible that you can act on one desire which you believe to be a lower desire than the other desire which you believe to be the higher desire, the thing you desire most, and yet you don't do it. Uh, I'm sure this never happens to you, but I have had students who definitely wanted to do their paper on time, but somehow or other, they were going to decide they are going to do the paper this very evening, but it got to be midnight, and there they were still in front of the television set having finished a six-pack of beer. Uh, uh, now, that's weakness of will, and I think such things happen. And of course, they're irrational. The question is, how are they possible if actions are caused by beliefs and desires? And this is a case where you had the highest desire. Now, it's, it, one way to answer it is to say, well, that proves that wasn't really, uh, you didn't really believe that was the best thing to do because you didn't do it. I don't think that's right. I really did believe it was the best thing to do, but I still didn't do it. Yes? Um, you, you, you slipped in there as fast as you could, and I want to do the best thing to do. Yeah. But I mean, that's just clearly not the case. You, you have these ideas of best. Yeah. That are moral, that are clearly correlated, but not, they don't cause your desire. Okay, so this is one, uh, one answer to the problem of weakness of will is you didn't really value the thing that, uh, that you said you, you valued. But what about the guy who, yeah, he really does value it. As, as um, uh, St. Augustine uh, uh, said, uh, God give me chastity, but not yet. Uh, he really did desire it, but he wanted to stall around for a while. Uh, and, and maybe that's a, a, a one way to describe the guy at the party. I'll, I'll be more virtuous at the next party. But that's a cop-out. I mean, I think that the, the real problem arises because you definitely have a, 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 a preference schedule, and yet you don't act on it. Now, there's some other forms of irrationality that are related to this that I'm going to come to. Yes? Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. The time figures largely in this, but that's, that, let's leave it out of this particular decision making. Because right now, at this particular point, I think I should be doing something else other than this. I should be not drinking the wine, but should be being virtuous right here and now. All the same, I'm drinking the wine. Right here and now, I think I should be preparing my lecture for Philosophy 138. This is an hour or so ago. But all the same, I'm not. I'm doing other things, uh, checking my email or other uh, ways that are uh, ways of stalling around instead of doing the thing I really think I ought, I most think I ought to be doing. Now, you, there is a, a, a conflict that's come up here, and this is uh, important, and that is, what about the conflict of duty and desire? where desire overcomes duty. Now, part of the classical model is you could only act on your duty if you wanted to, because every voluntary action is an expression of a desire to do that action. OK, now I think that is, again, a profound mistake, but I haven't yet got the resources to tell you. Let me show you some other difficulties with this account. You had your hand up, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A weakness of will tends to correlate with another a famous phenomenon, self-deception. Uh, and it's very easy to prove that weakness of will is impossible. Uh, the proof goes as follows. Anything you do uh, voluntarily, you do because you most want to do that thing. But what you most want to do is an expression of what you value then and there. Uh, uh, therefore, I, it's impossible for you voluntarily to do something that you don't most value to do then and there. And yet, weakness of will happens. The argument for self-deception goes as, against self-deception goes as follows. In order for A to deceive B, A has to believe something uh, and want to induce in B, uh, the, um, A has to believe that P and want to induce in B the belief that not P. But if A and B are identical, how would it be possible for me ever to deceive myself? because I would have to produce in myself a belief which I did not believe. So I really believe that we're going to have rain in the month of November, but I will convince myself that we won't have any rain in the month of November. How am I supposed to do that if um, I, I, I'm identical with the guy who holds both the belief and is supposed to be the victim, or supposed to be the recipient of the other belief? The problem is with weakness of will, as with self-deception, happens all the time. Self-deception is very common. How is it possible? I just gave you a proof that both weakness of will and self-deception are impossible, but they both happen. So in our theory of rationality, we've got to explain how they happen. Well, let me mention some other difficulties with this famous account. When I first read this account as an undergraduate, it occurred to me, on this account, if I value 25 cents a quarter, and I value my life, I, it follows that on this account, there are some odds at which I would bet my life against a quarter. Some odds uh, at which I'd bet my life against a quarter, because precisely uh, rationality consists in estimating the probability of satisfying your desires, giving your beliefs. Now, I have a very high desire for my life and a much lower desire for 25 cents. But if I desire both, if I have some desire for 25 cents, it follows mathematically, according to decision theory. If I'm rational, there must be some odds at which I would bet my life against 25 cents. And I have to tell you, there are no odds at which I would bet my life against 25 cents. Uh, and if there were, I mean, if in a reckless moment, uh, I, I wouldn't bet my child's life against 25 cents. I'm not risking my child at any odds. Now, here's the funny thing. I have argued precisely this point with the most famous decision theorists of the, of the last, of the 20th century, with Isaac Levy uh, and, what's that guy, name of that guy in, uh, Jimmy Savage in Ann Arbor. I argued with Isaac in, in, in Columbia and Jimmy Savage and they're the two best decision theorists. And they sadly came to the conclusion, you're just irrational. <laughs> now, I have to say, they got a problem about rationality with their theory. If their theory says that if you value your life and you value your 25 cents, there must be some odds at which you would bet your life against 25 cents. Here, let me give you one. I would take questions about this. this I think this whole subject is a lot of fun. Here's another thing that comes up. And it will come up in the next month. And it's this. It must be irrational uh, to vote. Why? Well, the chances that you will affect the outcome of the election are almost infinitesimally small. Let's take a presidential election, where there, you know, there are going to be 50 million people voting, at least for the winner. Uh, and the chances that your vote are going to affect the outcome are infinitesimally small. In California, they're worse than infinitesimally small because the preponderance of Democratic registered voters is so overwhelming I, I, that I, I, it's very hard to imagine a circumstance in which you would cast the deciding vote, even for the California electoral vote. So, but there's some disutility in voting. There's some cost to voting. You have to go in the poll booth and you got to stand in line and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but if that's the case, 
then it's always irrational to vote in an election. Uh, and there are the, always these famous anecdotes about the two famous economists who run into each other standing in line at the poll booth and they say, well, my wife made me come or something like that, or my spouse insists it's my civic duty. But, but just as a piece of rationality, it's irrational of you to vote uh, uh, because, well, it, it, there's a cost and no real probability of a payoff. You pay for something with your time and effort, but the chances that it's actually going to make a difference are much less than the chances you would have betting on the lottery. Now, some people have said, well, uh, there is, it, it's kind of rational to vote because it's like a lottery. There is an infinitesimally small chance that you will affect the outcome, but uh, there's some chance they're going to count your vote. So it's not totally irrational to vote, but you have a feeling that these guys are embarrassed to say that. Now, I think this, they have an extremely impoverished conception of rationality. If, I, I would want to say, in fact, the following. If you get the result that it's irrational in a democratic society to vote, th then you know you made a mistake. And one of the answers they have to me when I've debated these guys is to say, yeah, but you might think it's your civic duty. It's part of your duty as, assistant, as a citizen. Since when is a citizen under a duty to behave irrationally? After all, we've just established that voting is irrational. So how can I have a civic duty to do something which is mathematically irrational? I have no civic duty to add 2 plus 2 and get 5. And that would be like my, a, a civic duty to vote if, in, if it's just plainly irrational. Uh, OK, I think these are real difficulties with the classical model. Uh, that it has the effect that uh, there must be some odds at which I would bet my life against 25 cents. I, I, and I, the ingenuity that these guys have in meeting that argument, I'll tell you about them later. Um, uh, they say, well, you drive to San Francisco Airport, don't you? Right, OK. You're risking your life driving to San Francisco Airport. Yeah, in some sense. I, if I crawled out, get in bed and crawled on the covers, the chances of being killed are less than they are on the freeway. OK. Now, divide your trip to San Francisco Airport into 25 cent units. OK. Now, each time you pass one of those units, you're betting your life against 25 cents. Does everybody see how the argument goes? Uh, OK. I, that tell, then they have a more, they not only have a nutty conception of rationality, they have a nutty conception of the mind and intentionality. But we'll get to that later. I'll consider this argument in more detail. You had your hand up at the back. Yeah. OK, here's how it goes. Uh, uh, let me tell you the argument in some detail. Suppose I offered you $1,000 to drive to San Francisco Airport. Would you take it? Yeah, I could always use the extra 1000 bucks. I just paid my taxes, and I could use it more than ever. Uh, OK, now here's how the argument goes. But now, the $1,000 that you're going to get when you get to San Francisco Airport can be divided into 25 cent units, right? It's a finite, a finite division. And there will be some point on the freeway where you pass this part of the freeway and only made 25 cents. But by your own admission, in passing that part of the freeway, you're, in, you're risking your life. So you were betting your life against 25 cents. Ha! We refuted Searle. OK? Uh, I don't think that's a good argument. But you have to understand something about intentionality to see why it's not a good argument. I'll come back to that later. Uh, right now, I'm trying to lay out what some of the issues are. OK, let's go through these and see how far we get. I was going to get through all of these. And I'm not going to make it, but I'll get through a bunch of them. OK, to begin with, it is not the case that actions where rational are caused by beliefs and desires. Where, if we're talking about causation as giving causally sufficient conditions, then the actions that are caused by beliefs and desires are those that are compulsive, typically irrational actions. That's the guy who has an overwhelming desire to satisfy his urge to take heroin. And he has a belief that the stuff in front of him is heroin. So he is in the grip of his belief and desire. And his action is ca genuinely caused by beliefs and desires. But it's not rational. In fact, I, I've said this before, and I want to emphasize it now. As far as our phenomenology is concerned, as far as our experience is concerned, 
in normal rational action, you have a sense of alternative possibilities open. In the last election, uh, I had a choice between two candidates, and though I voted for one, uh, I considered the possibility of voting for the other, and it was a genuine possibility. It, it, given the causes operating on me, I voted for one candidate, but I could have voted for the other guy. So as far as my decision making is concerned, as we've seen already, the beliefs and the desires lead to a prior intention, and the prior intention leads to an intention in action, and there's a gap. There is a perceived gap between the reasons for the action and the decision. So far from it being a model of rationality, the cases where my beliefs and my desires are causally sufficient to fix my action are typically irrational or compulsive forms of behavior. In rational action, I have a sense of alternative possibilities open. And that, as I pointed out to you, that gap has a name. That's the so-called freedom of the will. Now, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe my actions are entirely caused my beliefs and desires. But that's not part of the definition of rationality. On the contrary, that is opposed to rationality because those would be compulsive actions. So when I make up my mind rationally, which of these candidates am I going to vote for, I do it on the presupposition that my antecedently existing beliefs and desires are not causally sufficient. I have to bridge the gap by making up my mind. As they say, I have to decide what to do. And there's a very peculiar locution in English that's going to figure large in our discussion, and that is I act on a reason. I had different reasons for voting uh, for McCain and different reasons for voting for Obama, but I made a specific reason or reasons effective by acting on that reason. Now, what does that mean? I acted on a reason. I, and I, well, I'm going to uh, say more about that when we talk about rational decision making. But the important thing is to see that characteristically, in rational decision making, I do not sense my antecedent beliefs and desires as setting causally sufficient conditions. Now, there is a problem that comes up, and I haven't addressed that, but I'm gonna, I've mentioned it in passing, and that is that typically in uh, hard decision making situations, some of my reasons are desire independent. I have reasons for doing something, even though I may not then and there feel a desire or an inclination to do it. And, it, and I have a, an apparent paradox I need to resolve. The paradox is this. All voluntary intentional actions are expressions of a desire to do that action then and there. And that's true even for, for uh, actions that are apparently motivated by desire independent reasons. Yes, all the same. I wanted to do that in order to keep my promise. And right then and there, I wanted to keep my promise. But if keeping my promise is a desire independent reason, and I act on that reason, then how can it be the case that my action is the expression of a desire to perform that action? if the reason for the action was a desire-independent reason. And that's an apparent contradiction in my account, and I have to resolve that. I haven't resolved it yet, but I'm going to resolve it. And I think it's very important about human rationality to see exactly how it can be the case that desire-independent reasons can motivate desires, even though the motivation for the desire was not another desire. One of the problems with this whole classical model that I'm describing here is it assumes that you have an inventory of prior desires before you approach the decision-making situation. That is false to human phenomenology. I ask the person in the restaurant, what do you want? What would you like? And she says, I don't know. Now, how can I, I, yeah, the Cartesian and all of us says, how can you not know what your own desires are? Everybody must know what their own desires are. But that is a common answer to the question of, what would you like? What do you want? I don't know. I, I haven't made up my mind. And guess what? Making up your mind is the name of rational decision making. 
In other words, the assumption that you come to the decision-making situation with an inventory of desires and then just decide how to satisfy your desires given your beliefs, that's a very artificial conception. Normally, in the decision-making situation, you've got to figure out what your desires are. You get a last question, then we'll stop. Yes. Yes, but the problem is here the pleasure is not separable from the choice of what I eat. So I'm trying to, and the way it actually works with me in a restaurant is I try to visualize do I really want a plate full of shrimp or do I want a plate full of steak? Uh, and then I try to visualize both. Now it's, it's okay to say, yes, but they're both pleasurable dining experiences. Which is more pleasurable? And by the way, I don't know why all restaurants don't adopt the Japanese method where you get a photograph of the damn thing that you're supposed to eat. Anyway, I'll bring photographs next time. We'll go on with this on Thursday.